have you ever felt fully accepted as a black man in hockey? Uh, not fully, no. You said in an interview, if you fight in hockey, you know what the penalty is going to be. If you call someone a racial slur, there's no penalty, there's no consequence. How do we change that? Apparently I was being political and, you know, trying to ruin hockey. <laughs> right? Ruin hockey. Even if you had $32 million, do you think athletes in general know how to transition and find purpose in something else? It doesn't matter how much money you got under your mattress when that's all done. If you don't have fulfillment in that sense of purpose, the money doesn't matter. The money does not matter. When you finally hung up the skates, what were <laughs> those first six months like? Oh time? man, I felt like I had a good exit plan. The hockey's dope and the hockey just doesn't know it yet. Hmm. Welcome to another episode of You Only Die Twice. I'm your host, Warren Ward, and today I'm joined by Mark Frazier. Mark is one of nine players to ever play for the Toronto Maple Leafs. He was drafted by the New Jersey Devils and also played for the Edmonton Oilers. In this episode, we take a deep dive into Mark's life on and off the ice, what it's like to be a black man in the NHL, and how he's using his platform to advocate for change. This was a really good episode because Mark is able to tell me what it's really like to be in the NHL, how he was able to overcome adversity and the mental challenge of being excluded from something when you're trying to be included. But before we start this episode, I know every other podcast asks you to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm not gonna do that because I know you will anyway. And without further ado, let's get into it. I wanna start with the why. Transition, as I said, is a fact of life. I'm aware that people deal with way harder things, and I really feel like this is a privilege. Um, you know, I think this can be a complaint for some, and I, I don't expect everyone to care. I don't expect everyone to to get what we're talking about right. here today. But um, to me, this is something that if you can relate to it, you don't have to be an athlete to do that. Um, and sure. that's why I wanted you to be here today. So I appreciate that. I'd love to understand why transition is important to you. Wow, why transition is important to me? Um, well, like you kind of just alluded to, it's, it's inevitable um, in all walks of life. Obviously, as as an athlete, you know that you know no one beats out mother time and eventually <laughs> father time. Father time, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's because of the snow that's out here right now. I've been thinking of uh, uh, mother nature. <laughs> mother nature is yeah. slapping us. My bad. <laughs> father time. Um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, you can't beat it, you know, it's, it's, gonna, it's inevitable for everybody, transitions in life from, you know, health to maybe not having health, wealth to not having wealth, careers, families, mm -hmm. you know, um, being single to being mm -hmm. a family man, yeah. being a dad, a father, mother, um, transitions are everywhere. Uh, it's, it's, it's growth in a lot of ways. Now, as an athlete or someone who's, you know, spent their entire life mm -hmm. chasing a particular path, a dream, everything from a little kid's age, from the parties you went to, when you went to bed, the things you ate, even if you had your fun, it was always still calculated, like, but I'm going to have to do this level of performance tomorrow. So as long as I can manage both. And then one day that just stops. And, and that experience and that, you know, rediscovering of one's identity is, is really maximized, like in that transition from an athlete from one to the next. But it's very relative, I think, to just mm -hmm. everyone's experiences. We're never in a singular headed path there's constantly forks in the road and each one's kind of its own transition and growth opportunity right. so it's very relative i think to this particular topic to and hence why it's important to always be able to be prepared and to not be a one-dimensional person yeah. or at least not identify as such have different layers to you because whatever skill you have that you know might provide for you opportunity money experience might not be there tomorrow exactly exactly and i, I was thinking about this today well not today yesterday um a lot of the firsts that I had in my life came from sports, mm -hmm. you know? So like the first time, and I'll be honest, the first time I ever had a woman like talk to me just because of something I could do through yeah. basketball, right? <laughs> yeah. Like the first time, a lot of the life experiences that I had a lot, like first time traveling outside yep. of Canada and going first and flight. living in, a, you know, I mean, living in another country yep. all came from sports and then it just stops, Yeah, you know? So all of those things are, important to to us and your identity mm -hmm. and then you, you end up stopping one day mm -hmm. and that, that 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 sucks and it's something to get over yeah and and you're right and it's uh i think I, for myself I, I felt like i had um a good exit plan 
Okay. Um, so for a lot of, you know, and, and I've seen documentaries and remember, I think this ESPN feature from a number of years ago and it was with Michael Strahan. I think there was a, you know, um, a Marine was maybe involved in, in this panel and, and there Tiki Barber, a few other guys. And it was really talking about even a guy like Brett Favre. He just wanted to go back home to his hometown after mm-hmm. you know, this amazing Hall of Fame career. I took an adjustment period because he couldn't go to a coffee shop in the small town where he's from, where there's a statue of him on the, the lawn <laughs> of the high school football, you know, for the football team. Uh, and you can't go to a coffee shop. That'll be like, Brett Favre. And then slowly after time, he was just reintegrated back. And I was like, oh, hey, Brett. But it's that rediscovery of, in that situation, like he's not trying to be that guy anymore. He's no. just trying to be a normal person, which to the core, we all just, are just normal folk. But for myself, yeah, I was... I always had interest outside of just hockey. I always had interest beyond my sport. Um, And then I was, some of the best advice I got is in the direction of wanting to lean into some of those creative talents or see like, what could I make out of this? I was encouraged to do it before I stopped playing. Mm. Um, I was a friend of mine whose whose dad owns Sony Pictures Classics and years ago he was here, he's here all the time for TIFF. He's always winning awards at these festivals, but, we were talking about the documentary storytelling space and production and just, you know, the other side of myself that didn't always have an opportunity to express in hockey. Mm-hmm. Um, but kind of like, well, what can I do? How can I like kind of parlay this into a storytelling? How do I do this? And again, the encouragement was, gave me a few pointers, but he said, don't wait till you're done playing to do it. Start working on this now. So by the time you're done, you're that many far, steps further ahead. Mm-hmm. And so with a couple different ideas I had, that's what I was doing, kind of anticipating maybe a year left, two years left in my career. So I at least felt like I had something to walk into mm-hmm. when I knew that I was no longer going to be say, hi, I'm Mark, the hockey player. Yeah. Um, now, it completely flipped on his head, and I'm in a role now that I in no way saw coming and kind of unfortunate circumstances in our world led to an opportunity for myself. But yeah, we'll get to that. For yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we will. But uh, no, yeah, so I was lucky in that transition for real that I just – I always loved like the more than the athlete slogan. Yeah. And I never just identified as like, I'm just a hockey player and that's it. Yeah. So I always felt like I had these other opportunities, a little bit of groundwork laid that would allow me, whatever that transition would look like, I at least know, hey, if I retire tomorrow, the next day I'm waking up at least with some type of purpose, mm-hmm. trying to, you know, carve out this new thing I've been working on. Yeah. And it's funny you bring up the word purpose. I think that's very um, impactful when it comes to sports and people who play sports. Um, but I want to start with, well, I want to talk about your, what drew you to hockey? Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to understand that. Honestly, I think. I mean, I don't really know. Uh, I played everything growing up. Like as a senior in high school, I think I played seven sports still. Um, at that, and I was like a year away from being an NHL drafted player. So like oh, it was wow. around that time. I was like, I probably have to like, cut a few of these out now. <laughs> um, but grew up playing competitive, a lot of things. Um, big track family. Played competitive soccer my whole life. Um, yeah, your dad's a sprinter, Olympic my, my sprinter. My dad was an Olympic sprinter for Canada, yeah. fastest man in Canada for about 10 years prior to the Ben Johnson era. Right. Uh, Jamaican immigrant, like many of, like Ben, like Donovan, yeah. like a lot of, like everybody, like a lot of Canadian <laughs> sprinters. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think, honestly, just a Canadian kid growing up in the 80s, uh, I was the youngest of three. My older brother played. Um, I think some of my earlier memories are literally like, without me being on the side and not really even being like, invited to quite participate but like driveway hockey i saw a picture recently with this project i was just doing um uh, across all-star weekend whereas you know my jamaican father in a snow-covered driveway standing in net and my brother and i are in the driveway and i'm like three okay um and you know we're playing hockey uh my buddies i grew up with you know um i think hockey was just around you want to do what your older brother did. My dad became a big fan of it. You know, mm-hmm. I think that was just the path for me. And then once you just kind of the purity of the game and like the skating portion, mm-hmm. you know, like take everything else away from it. When you're able to just kind of go fast on your feet, where you're not used to doing that. And then you get good enough where you can like cross over mm-hmm. and be a little bit, you know, agile, gain some speed, stop quickly, keep going. And then you wrap a sport around that. Yeah. Like it's kind of that just like, we, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like sail through the air I kind of feeling, that. you know what I mean? And I don't know. I think that was part of, that was it for me. Yeah. It was just, it was around me. A lot of folks were doing it. My family was into it. Um, getting into it as a kid, you don't recognize that maybe you might be different in it. You're just doing this thing that like the game itself, learning how to skate, slapping a puck around, like it just was fun. Yeah. I mean, I, I love skating. Hockey, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Fewer um, obstacles. Exactly. <laughs> But you know, I listen, Mark. You know, I have to ask you. I, this this is uh, obvious. This is an obvious question coming. I have to know what's it really like being a black man 
playing hockey? Um, I mean, in a lot of ways, it's it's great. It's fantastic because playing hockey and getting to play pro hockey is obviously amazing. Playing pro anything, you know, or doing anything professionally that you love is is a real privilege. I made it to the NHL while turning pro. Like you were saying earlier, some of the first you had just, you know, it took me to Europe. It took me all over North America, mm-hmm. the opportunities, the rooms I got into. Being black in hockey in that sense was, was, was great. And then there's this, I always felt in my career, there's a real benefit to being different as mm-hmm. well. Um, I was, I'm very proud to be black. I'm biracial. I'm half black, half white. But uh, certainly in a lot of hockey spaces, you're the black one. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of ways where I... That that being different and that like pride and black culture and hip hop and and all that like that was something that was liked in the room and it was actually my culture mm-hmm. was, I represented. Sometimes being in these spaces like I see that y'all are y'all rep what my community is doing mm, right and that's me and my community. Um, at the same time, there's there's ways where it's like you're proud and it's cool to be the one, and other times you're you're often reminded that mm-hmm. you're the black one. Um, it's How? Su- uh, nonstop, really. It, it's uh, and not always in an egregious way, but kind of just in the constant little subtleties of being reminded in a space. Um, again, Canadian kids so very easily could um, be comfortable in hockey and hockey arenas, hockey locker rooms around the guys on the road, whatever. Um, there's a lot of ways where I, I would joke like I was very comfortable with um, you know, a white culture. I grew up uh, with older siblings and, you know, my sister used to listen to from REM or Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, like, you know, that's, okay. you know I love that alternative rock as well. There's that 90s kind of grunge. Um, so you can like hang in areas like that, parties like that, go to clubs or that's bumping, um, parties, whatever. And then something will remind you is like, oh, right, but I'm black. <laughs> something will, <laughs> something right. will happen that like no one else is like dealing with, feeling, receiving. Uh, it could be a look. It could be, you know, walking into a hockey arena and, and it's perceived that you m- might be unsure where you are or yeah. are supposed to be here, <laughs> yeah. um, where any one of my teammates could walk into a hockey rink and they'd just be presumed that, you know, oh, this is clearly a hockey player. Yeah. Um, to just like the, a lot of, um, a lot of ignorance to just from, from any particular person or level of just when folks don't know what they don't know. So I'm a person, I'm a hockey player. They're very familiar with that. But like being a black hockey player, there's a lot of things where this would be uncommon or unfamiliar to them, whether it's a cultural thing, whether it's an actual language to use, um, uh, a joke that might not actually be a joke. Um, yeah, borderline You know, racist. what we call, yeah, a lot of microaggressions. Um, but that kind of stuff was kind of routine. But in a lot of ways, it, was, it wasn't that much different than sometimes being black in society. You know, you're very much able to coexist, thrive, have opportunity, there's opportunities for black excellence and we're a very resilient community. At least that's my perspective of it. Uh, that being said, there's undoubtedly going to be challenges sometimes just walking down the street, yeah. coming out of a store, you know, yeah. going up to someone you want to speak to in the first impression, trying to dismantle the first impression or prejudice Five that minutes, I might be yeah. a thug. Yeah. Um, really, um, likely someone you've actually watched perform before. Exactly. You know, so it's, it's a lot of that invisible... Um, hurdle jumping and, and sort of navigating that that others just probably never have to do. You spoke about um, in a TSN interview. Talk about taking out your earrings. Mm-hmm. You, t- you spoke about being clean shaven on your passport photo. That's yeah. not something that maybe other people had to experience. Um, and you also talked about checking in your mirror in your car to make sure you were. Yeah, I watched <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to make sure you were presentable. Yeah. Do you think those things are things other people might have to experience? Or is it just you want it to be perfect and make sure that there was no other bias anyone could say about you? No, I think a lot of us, um, and not probably just exclusive to hockey, but I think that's something that a lot of us would have dealt with. Um, I, I, got, I got mad respect for an OG like Lou Lamorello, um, you know, and had him for a long time in my career. as a, He was a general manager, CEO, president, so... Um, micromanager <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know uh to sum it up with the new jersey devils um had him twice there for pretty much half my career and he's very militant you know he's that new york yankees george steinbrenner clean shaven haircut like everyone runs the same and and you know coaches or whatever with tease like shaving this morning because shaving is what wins hockey games you know <laughs> i understand the discipline that and to be honest in a lot of ways i'm grateful for the discipline that a lot of like his regime if you will would teach a young professional 
five minutes early means you're late. Like random little yep. things like this. Yep. But then when it comes to like the physical expression and I mean, even just hockey hair, there's a particular extent where like hockey hair, he would want it cut, but other guys could, but, but my hair could be short, but if it's twisted in a way, like that would be probably be unacceptable. So you couldn't play like that? No, not just with Lou. I wouldn't be comfortable to play with, with dreads ever. Um, there's been players who had dreads who were told to cut them. Um, there's, I have buddies who are my age who are now kind of have been on the other side of scouting. They've been in scouting rooms and talking about a black prospect and the conversations about the guy's hair until finally someone steps and says, why are we talking about this guy's hair? Hmm. Um, what does this have to do with, with the us sport. evaluating this yeah. player? Yeah. Um, so that's again, back to like the unfamiliarity. It's, it's, not to say that in every room or every organization or situation I would have been in, there would have been this prevention per se, but it certainly wasn't, it doesn't make you feel like you can do that, be you. Even the role I'm in now, a couple years ago when the dreads were new, I said to, I was, I was doing some work with the, as I do with the Maple Leafs and the Leafs players, I was holding a session with them. And essentially this part of the session, I was saying, look, I'm here literally to let y'all know that like you, you be your authentic self. Like, no cliche with it, just who you got to be to perform and to execute and to be in this space. Like we all love each other. Don't like, let that fly. Let that be who you need to be. Don't all feel like you got to conform. So now that being said, some of y'all who knew me from before will recognize that my hair is different. Mm -hmm. And I've legit for the last couple of days in the mirror been like, Mark, you cannot go into the rink looking like that. So I'm here to tell you guys to be your authentic self, but I want you to recognize that me, the guy, the director of culture inclusion telling you this, the former player, some of your teammate, I'm still not convinced myself that I can. And I hope that resonated with them because I'm definitely more confident to do that now. But at the time, like that was, I need them to hear, we're at a time where this is now being encouraged, but I myself am not convinced I can do it. Why is that? Hmm. So interesting, man. I mean, so did you, so like, have you convinced yourself? Are you, are you more comfortable now? I, I have, yeah, for sure I have. Um, I've definitely been into some some significant rooms in hockey, uh, courtesy to you know my employers and and uh, you know my boss and, and Brandon Shanahan has done a great job in uh, providing opportunity for me to continue to grow and and see more layers of the business at a really high end. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got to show up like me. Um, there's probably in some large rooms some early perception or. Um, you know, typecasting, if you will, of, yeah. uh, of you what, what, what this might represent. <laughs> yeah. But um, no, I definitely am. But it's 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 taken honestly time to get there. Like without being in the role that I am to kind of empower this message, I'm still not sure I would do it. Yeah. One of my friends said um, he's biracial, and this is something I never thought about. Um, he said growing up, he kind of had to pick a side. And if you go to like you know any sort of like like family outing. You have your white family yep. and your black family. And usually there's just cultural norms. We're different. They're yeah. just different. You know, white people might be wearing Sperry's and black people listening to whatever they're, yeah. you know, whatever yeah. they got on or, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, you know, do rag or eating yeah. chicken or something, you know, just whatever, whatever <laughs> base or biases that yeah. we assign. And I, I thought about that. And I said, it's interesting because as a hockey player, you might have to associate with a side. You can't play certain music right. in the locker room. You might have to dress a certain right. way as a hockey player. Did you find yourself doing that? Yeah, definitely. And like kind of to like the, the earlier question, it's that's in some ways where being biracial, sometimes it's like you're not black enough and then sometimes you're not white enough. Exactly, yeah. But at the same time in those spaces, because I was black, at least how I chose to use it, being both black and white in time, like made me feel a little bit like a chameleon at times in a good way, in a sense where well, I can speak both languages. Mm -hmm. Now, I still obviously am having to maybe go an extra mile to disarm uh, or to convince someone that I'm not this stereotype of what a black hockey player might be or whatever a young black man running wild might be, whatever. Uh, but at least, I guess what I'm saying is it was easier for me to find some normalcy and familiarity for myself with whatever white culture is as, as we're talking about it, especially mm -hmm. in hockey, because that actually was part of me. Yeah. When I'm hanging on my mom's side and obviously, you know, incredibly proud and love my, my family. So my mom's and my family are some OGs as well. And really happy for the character, character and moral values that side of my family has instilled in me. Um, but hanging with those cousins and aunt uncle, like when you're talking hockey, like 
I, it's very, it's a white room. <laughs> yeah. I don't recognize it as much cause it's my family, but in that situation, I'm just saying like I was raised and brought up in that, but it also doesn't mean that I can't be on the Jamaican side of my family mm-hmm. doing jam day and, and not, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, there's both sides of it. So because I had Eating patties, of, and exactly stuff. <laughs> because I have both of those experiences, like I was a guy on the road, wherever I was in a new city, I'd try to find a Jamaican restaurant or West Indies restaurant to try to bring too. some guys in and be like, you ever try rice and what do you mean rice and peas? There's no peas in this, you know, <laughs> like trying to teach that each time. So I could, I could kind of like go both ways, I guess is what I'm saying. But definitely sometimes at the detriment of like, ah, oh, but in this place where I can literally speak both languages, there's times where I feel like no one can speak mine. Hmm. Bar. Yeah. As successful as you've been in your career, I mean, you made it to the highest level. You know, you're, we have, I don't think we've had anybody on the show that's, well, no, we've had some NBA people, but we haven't had anyone who played in the NHL. So well, you're the appreciate first. appreciate that. Of course. Thank you. Highest level. Have you ever felt fully accepted as a, as a black man in hockey? Uh, not fully. No. Um, how does that make you feel? Um, that's a good question. I, I mean, it's unfortunate. Um, but at the same time, I've definitely been accepted. There's great people. Um, you know, what I've been able to accomplish showed that there was people that obviously didn't, um, care to evaluate me based on any racial bias or whatever. Um, perhaps some small little subconscious element, but not enough to like prevent me or hold me back per se. I'm sure some opportunities, um, it may have been a factor in the decision or outcome, but overall, you, yeah, to your point, I got to, I got to excel in it. So there's a lot of ways where I still got to thrive. I still got to be, a lot of my teammates would know like phrase, my nickname here in Toronto started as it was Big Sug or Sug, so I got a lot of Sug still in this in this, in <laughs> okay. this city in this in this in these rinks. It's a lot of Sug or Sugi. People know who Sug is. They know who Phrase is, um, and that feels true to me. But it's real. If I'm being honest, it's probably like not. It's not the full. It's not mm-hmm. the fully being like you said. It's not the all the way 100. Yeah. Um, I'm able to be a bit more of the authentic me now, mm-hmm. uh, at least with less reservation or concern about. You know, it's not going to prevent this job opportunity. It's not going, I'm not going to be too unfamiliar that if it's fighting for a position between A and B and, you know, understandably someone with a decision-making power might just lean towards where they comfortably have a bias. Mm -hmm. I don't have any leaders, never had a coach, a GM, a president, owner, trainers even who look like me. So there's never, you're always battling like, where am I going to get the benefit of like a friendly bias? Exactly. Um, But that's an uphill battle. Right. It totally is. And it's still very much there now. Again, I'm very much accepted in this space. I've done pretty much everything you could just other than win <laughs> at, at, the, <laughs> at this level um, to prove my worth, to like show my resume yeah. as like a, an elite hockey player, an NHL executive, someone who's like in this fabric and part of this fabric. Um, I think it's slowly coming. We did some, some dope things over All-Star that kind of really mm-hmm. was able for myself and others like us in hockey that really felt like... We let our hair down. The others who are around, the, the folks, the non-black folks who are at some of these things were like, literally looking around the room, you're like, oh, I get it. I, I get it now. And it's like, see, it it works. Doesn't yeah. it? You know? So we're slowly carving out space where you, I feel like I can just be me. Um, because just because I want to, you know, wear Jordans on, you know, in the front office floor of, of, of MLSC doesn't mean that I'm not a professional. Yeah. Nice you know? shoes, by the way. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. You, you know, um, I understand. I'm, I'm not always going to be the suit and tie guy, but I, you know, I'm not going to have a complaint when I throw a suit on for a game because I get that that's what we do. But also, like, I'm an executive, so I'm not trying to like die on that hill. But there's just different ways and touch points where I can execute and do a great job. And my work ethic, talking about the transition, the skills I'm able to do that with now are all things I learned from being a pro athlete and a, just an elite competitive athlete. You know, a lot of what I'm trying to do is build in all lanes of our business, the locker room, community, fandom, build advocacy and support. So I'm constantly trying to like sell something in a way that's not scary and makes sense. And so I need to be taken seriously in order to do that. So you're doing a dance of like, I want to be perceived as professional. I want you to hear what I'm saying and not judge me on maybe how I look Mm -hmm. to understand that what I'm saying makes sense. And it makes sense because I'm also speaking your language. Mm -hmm. Ooh, and there's new revenue generation opportunities tied at the end of this as well, or potential for such. That's what, you know, 
It's a win-win. I mean, that's what we all want, exactly. Now just let me do that with braided back dreadlocks and Jordans and, and maybe a hoodie the odd day. You know? Um, Why not? Because I think you can see, you see, you know, in a space like basketball with a guy like Masai, I look up to him and he's um, – very much a professional, very much suited and booted a lot of the times, but there's a casual side to him. Where he's like, he so. looks like he could just is feeling different in like a thin hoodie or something, but still very, no one would ever look at that man and be like, oh, but he's not a pro. But, but sorry to cut you off. You know why? The, well, you know what the difference is? And this, and this was my next question. Masai is in a sport where 95% mm-hmm. of the people look like him. Absolutely. So my question really is, why would you end this – this may sound ignorant, but why pick a career where your the color of your skin already did like already already like deters you from right. being a Maasai, where Maasai can just walk around comfortably. Right. Like you 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 chose to pick a an uphill battle essentially yeah. from the beginning. I like I like that question because my my answer is uh, well in some ways like I didn't choose hockey. Hockey chose me. Um, like I said, I played a lot of sports growing up. I had, when it came to really make a decision, it probably would have been hockey, soccer, or track. And hockey was the obvious one because realistically, I was probably the best at that versus the other two. Right. But just for career, to pay the bills, traveling opportunity. I mean, track, you got to be like top 10 in the world to really yeah, like, get know, paid. Right? You know? Yeah. Um, and even if you are, trust me, we've we've had hard, some other right. people out here. They they didn't get paid, right? Exactly. And I'm from that world. I got a lot of buddies in that world. Like so, I get that. Um, so I mean, hockey chose me in that sense. It, uh, it it it's you know where your gifts are. You can't just uh, turn that off. And if there's a real opportunity there, like generational opportunity, opportunity to help my family in in ways that I never would have thought imagined. I mean, I'm not not going to pursue that just because I'm black. But you also make these decisions when you're really young, and it hasn't maybe. Um, you know you're different, racially speaking, but you don't necessarily know how the system looks at you differently or mm-hmm. the ecosystem or institution gen- in general looks at you. The business perhaps might. There's things you might have dealt with with an odd fan at some tournament or whatever. Um, but in a young mind, that you don't understand like the institutionalized um, issues that might still be underneath at that point. So why I chose that sport, I think it also chose me, but... If it wasn't hockey, um, I talked to a colleague, uh, I don't know, just within the last year who's saying, you know, he's black and he's saying, like, I don't, I never, I never was down with hockey because I always felt like it wasn't, there, there was none of me in there, mm-hmm. um, didn't identify with it, and then talked about this experience coming out of school, very creative guy, but he was coming out of school and I think got a job in the bank at first and was going down that path and was like, man, that world wasn't for me. There was no, I was like, so you avoided hockey your whole life. Because he thought I didn't speak to you, just to go get a job in an environment <laughs> where you went through the exact same thing I would have gone through. Exactly. But at least mine was like entertainment, and you, you and know? you like what you're doing, and I'm still doing it yeah, now. Exactly. You know? Like uh, so, in a lot of ways, <clears throat> excuse me. It's like why avoid it just because we're not there? When you first get into it, especially as a young kid, you don't think like that. But then, as you have opportunity to continue to grow, and you start to hear, oh, well, like, you know, representation matters. You have an opportunity to build the ones behind you are watching you. Um, it was very evident to me as a kid playing you know, Nintendo 64, play early versions of PlayStation, whatever, like you trade for all the black players in the league to be on, <laughs> on your team. <laughs> but like that's representation mattering. So I'm a 10, 12 year old or whatever, like scrolling through all the rosters, like there's a black guy, trade for him. There's a black guy, trade yeah. for him. And those types of things, sure, few and far between as far as percentages, they allowed me to see myself there, allowed me to believe I could. And now that I've been there, done that, I integrated well, didn't offend anyone. And I'm now, you know, empowered to be in a position where I actually get to intersect with the business, with the culture, with operations, a new perspective Mm -hmm. that speaks to so many more people outside of our four walls, but people who already rep our game or are interested in the game or love the game. We can all grow up and go to the bank and be like, oh, this wasn't a space for me. That shouldn't prevent someone who like really wants to be in, you know, whatever, a financial advisor to like still chase that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you might have to deal with a lot of BS that sometimes might make you question if it's worth it or not. Which you did. Yes. And there's times where I definitely, it wasn't worth it. And there's times where it was because, you know, I still have this once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah. It's amazing what you'll take on the chin and smile through. Um, I smile a lot less now because, again, I feel like I'm in a situation, a position where I don't have to tolerate that dumb comment, that ignorance. Um, 
and and it's not always from a position. It's certainly a lot always from a position of 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 hate or or bigotry. A lot of times, it's literally just ignorance. It's mm-hmm. just folks don't know. We're so international as a sport, but in a lot of communities or countries, it's not necessarily diverse backgrounds. I played in Europe for three years, and I used to count depending where I was. I used to count the amount of black people I'd see when I was over there. Me too. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes it was a lot. Sometimes it was definitely not. Yeah. Um. So you know that all of that together woven in, there's just like there's more opportunity to create space for. It's more than just X type of person yeah. who plays this game. But for a long time, X has been the only one represented, the one making the rules, the one that's, you know, called all the shots, made the decision, um, you know, how we market, how we grow. And the perspectives, this city, I mean, look around. It's so different. Cultural, yeah. Right? It's so different. And all these people, I think, will love hockey and are interested. Back to that, like, wee feeling of just, like, going on, going fast yeah. on the skates. Yeah. I think there's a lot of intrigue there. Just if we're not tapping into those perspectives, it's hard. So I get to do that now. But hockey chose me. I wasn't able to deviate from that path. Love that. Love that answer, man. That's uh, so important. I mean, you definitely, not only are you someone who is... Um, essentially sacrificing yourself like you're on the front line saying i'm gonna i'm gonna climb this uphill battle and now you're in a position where other people can see you in the front and you know it, i think that's so important for other people who are of color and who who aren't of color yeah, doesn't matter for sure to see someone who is and in a you know in a position of prominence so um hats off to you for thank that, you for sure man Appreciate um that. you said in an interview in tsn last year which i i loved by the way um you said if you fight in hockey you know what the penalty is going to be. If you call someone a racial slur in in hockey, um, it might go to a board to be reviewed for six months. Yeah, there's no penalty. There's no consequence. How do we change that? Um, if at all. If yeah, well, first, I mean, and I think in that reference, it was to not necessarily even, prof- although at some levels of professional hockey, um, I like to think if that would happen in the NHL by now, they'd have some knowledge on how to react, but we've seen it recently happen in other minor leagues of like pro hockey in the AHL East coast league in Europe. Um, certainly in minor hockey, youth hockey. Um, first of all, it's, it's, uh, not being afraid to address it. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. like right away. Um, how do we change that is, is acknowledging that like this happens. Um, it's not a one-off, like it happens especially in the minor level, like with kids, it happens far more than it should be, yeah. um, which doesn't make sense to me as like the years go by that it almost could be happening more frequently, at least for some of the numbers I see. How do we change that is is not being afraid to address it and um, accountability by like, I mean, they, the folks who are, who are making some of these decisions who, who understandably to some degree are like, I don't, oh man, we don't know how to handle this one. What do we do, you know? <laughs> bring people in not just like uh what well, could be whatever it could be um an advisory of you know racialized parents coaches uh executives community sport folk what i don't know um government level i mean a lot of these bodies are also tied to our government it ain't that hard to figure out what to do when something racial happens with regards to clean safe you know playing field of sport and some type of penalty mm-hmm. or retribution that that shouldn't be very difficult. Um, consider the detriment of if, if something's not handled swiftly and appropriate, like a cross check to the face would be, what's that saying to the victim or that family or that person? Um, yeah. Even, even, even if you don't know how to handle it, it's telling them routinely like, yo, y'all just still don't know how to handle this in 2024. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you don't know how to handle that. Um, that's a real disservice. Um, so if you need to lean on a committee of folks who have knowledge or direction, then, then do so and then implement it and, and hold accountability. If, if coaches aren't delivering the proper message, if proper message, if, you know, institutions or, or hockey bodies, uh, associations aren't doing the same with general managers, with parents, with players, I mean, it's really not that hard to do. Um, it's a shame that there's not enough of a playbook for this not to say that it happens every single day in a rink but i'm sure it does yeah and we i mean we had soroya on here and that's one of the first things she talked about was her first experience and she 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 didn't forget her first racial experience yeah yeah no no and none of us do because especially if we're young enough it's kind of it's a again we understand we're different but it's never come to a head where like adults are conjugating and people are like something bad happened and you're this kid thinking like 
I'm not even sure what this all means. I just mm-hmm. know that it was directed towards me, and, and I've never been in a situation where parents after a game are all talking to figure something out that had nothing to do with the game itself. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so it, it shouldn't be difficult, but I think, you know, look, I'm not Indigenous, but in my position, and a couple of years ago when we first held our uh, our first ever Maple Leafs Indigenous celebration game, something I was very proud of, it was executed beautifully, um, you know, the indigeneity was represented throughout the Leaf brand and night very organically and in a way I know made a lot of indigenous community far and local mm-hmm. feel seen, feel really proud. The way our players and others were integrated into it, the educations we had associated to it, so there was real learning, not just sort of performative. I'm not indigenous, but I have friends out there. I had, you know, from John Shabbat, who's a former NHL player, and I play with his son. Um, his sister, Lisa, is, is in Ontario uh, government um, in Aboriginal Affairs. Marion Jocko, president of the little NHL, Little Native Hockey League, and also now a second year, entering her second term for three years, a new board member for Hockey Canada, nice. also a children's lawyer. Um, friend uh, Gary Maracle, Indigenous OPP superintendent. Um, David Ako is the MLSE's uh, Indigenous Reconciliation Consultant. My, I had like four or five of these professionals, you know, members of the community, all different types, hockey affiliated as either a fan or actually community or professionally. I was like, how do I do this? You know, here are the elements. Here's the run of show. Here's the game. Here's all the different things we can do. Here's what players can do. Here's what an education can be. Here's what a gifting can be. What do we do for fans? What's the stories? What's the messaging? Where's the art come from? What type of vendors do we integrate with? Right. Who do we spotlight and how do we do this to make sure we're doing it right? And you it, found a way to do that. Of course. It ain't that hard. Right. <laughs> like, I'm so. not suggesting that the, like, work isn't hard, but, like, the ability to connect and be like, I'm not from y'all community, but we're trying to do something that's going to su- support and celebrate and do it right and make sure it's a foundation now of just the fabric of how the, what the Leafs do every year. Yeah. A lot of Canadian teams are doing this. Um, all of them are. Again, I'm not Indigenous, but I figured that one out. So if a leader isn't doesn't have experience being a racialized person or a black or BIPOC person and doesn't know what it's like, even in a small way of every day walking into work and security asking for your credential and not asking for your peers. Those small little things every day that we would have to navigate through, even if you don't have that perspective, build something, talk to the people who do, who are from this space, whatever that space might be, and see where improvements can be made. It's not that hard, but it's conversation, it's actual action, and it's actually caring. It's actually given enough to want to do it. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well said. Um, you retired in 2021. And um, when you finally hung up the skates, I'd, I'd love to know what were <laughs> those first six months like? Uh, we're oh, retiring. man. That's, uh, there's, a, there's a few different seasons within that six months. Um, I, I was content to retire. I remember it was like right before the pandemic hit. I think it was probably like January 2020. My last year was in Germany. I was playing with one of my best friends growing up, Mike Blunden. Um, we hadn't been teammates since we were like 15 because he oh, went wow. in, as a 16-year-old. He was an underager in the OHL and left school and all that and, and played against each other a bunch. We were the two friends in our friend group who both made it to the NHL. Um, but then I just got to reconnect with him afterwards, like be teammates again. We were both captains of the, this, this team in, in Germany. Um, so that part was dope. And I remember it was January, we were in Berlin, and a guy who was our age, so we were like probably 33 or so, another guy our age was just re-signed by the team. I was the captain. They did not want to re-sign me or bring me back. Um, Mike was talking to the team still, like, maybe they'll bring him back. And I just remember these two guys. One signed, one is talking to the team, team's not talking to me. And I remember having a pregame meal in the hotel with them, just being like, I can't wait for this to be done. <laughs> like, I can't. But in a good, in a positive way, like, I... Um, I, I don't, there's nothing like pushing me to do this anymore, whether it's, you know, the opportunity to travel, the camaraderie, um, money, whatever it might be, uh, the love of the game itself. I was like, I'm content. It was 14 years around seven in the NHL. I didn't, uh, I was content. And as I mentioned earlier, cause I had things, other things sort of like some foundation laid some steps ready to like immediately when this is done, I'm going to start doing X. What um, was X? X was building a startup with a buddy of mine that was essentially going to, it was leveraging um, athletes and some other like elite performers and their experiences with some of these transitional skills uh, for speaking engagements. It was something that actually, because the pandemic pivoted to very much a virtual platform, but the virtual platform we were using was very interactive and engaging. So basically it was whether, you know, we take 
educated, curated uh, curriculum on leadership, communication, diversity and inclusion was something I was already doing. Um, and just plugging, so it's like a script, and you just plug and play sort of the athlete's own personal anecdotes. So okay. you're going to ex- express what this, like, this version of leadership versus this version of leadership, tied into your own anecdote of, like, so Lula Morello used to lead like this, and now you're giving them, the audience, your a story, own, right. you know, that's like kind of a cool name drop, something from your elite experience, and then an engagement of, like, having them feed you information back through like a, a live Q&A sort of through the digital platform. So they're digesting it. But it was basically just continue to leverage athletes' experiences, those who are able to articulate and communicate well, and show them how to basically be speakers on topics that they don't maybe know yet, but they're actually like quite expert in. Mm-hmm. And that was it for me. And that transition is like, I know, I know I'm a good worker. I know I'm creative, smart guy. I can do certain things. But you do have an imposter syndrome and there's just an unfamiliarity of like, but how, I don't know, how do you apply leadership skill when a new, when I don't know what my job is right now, you know, like I know I do that really well. Um, I know I work hard, but like, how do I work hard when I'm not exactly sure the direction I'm going in? So it's it's hard to do it and get paid. So it's hard to kind of like let that click. Like I have, sure people say I have all these skills. How do I apply these skills? Uh If it's not to my craft on the ice or field or court, like I don't, how do I apply them in the real world? So I was navigating through that a bit. Um, so that's how, anyways, I knew I was happy to be done. I immediately kind of stepped into that, at least kept myself busy because we were building something we were passionate about, cared about. Did you, sorry, I don't mean, did you start this before, before you retired? We were were built, we were building it, um, in that 1920 year, uh, but like actively working on it was after I retired and like pandemic shut down our season. I don't know, some, you know, early March, just a few days, weeks early for us, um, so flew home a little bit early, you know, chilled in those few early months of everyone who <laughs> was chilling, not knowing what to do. But then once I kind of in the spring, summer started picking this back up again, and that's when we really started running with it. And so again, my, my retirement plans were, I'm not doing anything with hockey. Yeah. Um, cool. 14 years. Uh, you know, some media folk are like, would you ever want to do this? Nope. I don't want to scout. I don't want to coach. Yeah. Same um, I'm out. I'm leveraging my experiences as an athlete to create new opportunity through these speaking engagements, networking, whatever, performance in a different way. Um, and then George Floyd got murdered. And everything just kind of flipped after that. Uh, I mean, no, none of us obviously saw that coming. I certainly didn't see that coming. And then for me, it was, um, you know, you talked earlier about the transition and that the struggle with identity. And, and I mean, I was 33 when I retired, probably started playing hockey around three maybe four, at least skating at three. So the ability for me to just at any point, not that I ever led with this, but at any point to be like, hi, I'm Mark, the hockey player. You know, I'd never, I typically like to think, would try to make you think I'm not a hockey player. <laughs> so that you were just talking to me because you're like, oh, he's a hockey player. But you know what I mean? Like that was a part of me for the entire, my entire life. No longer playing. I'm just a black man in Ottawa figuring out his next steps. This happens. I'm someone who's always cared a lot about social advocacy. Um, you know, my first two book reports as like a fourth grade, like a 10 year old, one was on Jackie Robinson and one was on Bobby Orr. So I became, you know, an NHL defenseman and um, clearly I've always cared about black empowerment, you know, systemic and social issues and black history. Mm-hmm. And so very much understood the weight of what was going on. And then, you know, following the Jacob Blake shooting and now it's starting to really intersect in sport where you're seeing players and teams and leagues boycott um, even if only for 48 hours, just that we got to pause because something so serious, some, a humanitarian, a human thing that is hitting all of us in societies across the world. There's peaceful protests happening in Berlin, Paris, London, Australia. S- the world's kind of on fire right now. And all of us are at home during a pandemic watching it. And my naivety is to think like that would have been over in the 60s in the u.s like that that's a world we don't live in anymore you know that type of sort of like police that. violence like you know just uh, didn't matter black white young old male female like the abuse that individuals who were standing up for something were, were, were physically dealing with in the streets it was crazy i just you know never never thought i would see that i never thought it would be the genesis would be from a black man being so carelessly killed by a police officer on camera um what really killed me is that hockey 
didn't know how to react and 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 I and because of that didn't react now internally and there's also you know some bubble was happening and all that because the pandemic there might have been some discussion but I, I know enough and I certainly saw enough having been from it that they weren't mm-hmm. um you know so I'm just again navigating who am I now I'm not that hockey player anymore but I'm this black man who's spent his whole life in this game and I felt duped I felt like why did I give my entire life to this this thing um if then something real like this that just hits me as a as a person they can't recognize that serious damage like the there's so much more than just that one individual's life it was what it meant um like generationally speaking like i said the footage you'd wake up every day on instagram i'm checking and i'm just immediately in tears because it's like the the riots are crazy i'm not talking about the riots and smashing up stores i'm talking about like police cars driving through crowds of people it was nuts no, it's crazy um pepper spray and tear gas and folks who are just trying to like stand up for something that we can all agree was actually wrong <laughs> you know and it just reminded me of this time that i thought was well behind us but clearly was not and the inability for my world to react in what I thought was any appropriate manner really hurt me. Um, so, like I said, the diversity inclusion sort of speaking thing was already something I was doing to begin with. I just started leaning in a bit more. I found my voice. I had a teammate, in, a former buddy in Erica Branson, who grew up in my area, um, reach out. Uh, he's like, "Can I, I, I want to say something, but I don't know if like the, a white guy's voice is needed right now and I said a hundred percent it is because our voices aren't being heard your voice carries a lot more weight in these moments so I walked him through kind of what to say he wrote an article and I thought man why am I like helping this dude I should be writing my own sat down the next day penned something out like basically across the entire afternoon reached out to player tribute myself got it in got the f- amazing feedback from it editors like you know we get things from athletes normally we got a red pen at a lot it's like we're barely touching this one a couple grammatical things but like mark this is real um it was very emotional like emotionally written and anyways it came out and even things in it like my mom my white mom was like one of my biggest obviously my biggest fan right my mom's like i hope so I, there's moments where she, she she hit me up like the next day when it came out being like i didn't i didn't know some of this mm-hmm. stuff. I assumed, you know, you talk to dad about whatever when something might occur, but, um, you know, so when your own mom doesn't know and not in a bad way, just in like, she's ignorant. She's just exactly yeah. just didn't as- don't assume that her biracial children go out into the world and obviously deal with things. But to the extent of which that might've happened for her son, who was at a pro level of hockey, she really didn't know. So my own mom in that sense doesn't know. Um, yeah, the hockey world really did not know what to do. Yeah. Um, my mom's a lot better than most of like the broader hockey world we're talking about as far as how to react on the human level. But so that's what it was for me. So that just sparked something. I got basically more vocal. The article helped me find my voice. It came with a lot of criticism, of course, because a lot of people didn't like what I had to say. Of course. Um, cause apparently I was being political and, you know, trying to ruin hockey, but <laughs> <laughs> right? ruin hockey. But, um, what came from it though is. When play resumed in the bubble here in Toronto, I saw the Maple Leafs wear Black Lives Matter t-shirts. And that was a team-led thing, and it was John Tavares who wanted to do that. And he had asked management and kind of explained to them his why. Um, I don't believe it was a complete unanimous decision in that room to wear BLM versus an All Lives Matter couple of opinions. But nonetheless, it happened, and it was like that beam of light. It was that sign I saw that was like, ooh, maybe they're ready to hear what I have to say. Mm. So I reached out through like one colleague who was still, I knew at MLSE, got a, a, a letter in front of Kyle Dubas, or GM at the time, and basically just said, you know, he knew me a little bit, but I didn't have much relationship with them. I'm obviously an alumni and said, here's the four topics, the, the four things I'd like to talk about within this topic, if you'd have some time. He very quickly responded back in email. We set some time up. It's, pende- it's, it's the bubble maybe heading into eventual playoffs. Like and I was thinking, I'm gonna, not going to get much time from this guy. And uh, the first question I asked him was, we're on Zoom, and I said, like, what's your um, opinion of what's happening? And he gave me, like, I thought I'd have, like, 30 minutes. He gave me, like, a 19-minute answer. And I closed my notebook, and I was like, this guy does not need an education. He gets it. He knows. Um, they just don't know what to do. 
Mm-hmm. Um, Which is to your point earlier about yeah, not knowing. They for sure know what's up and what's wrong and that it's not cool and that it needs to be better. They themselves just aren't sure how to do that. Mm-hmm. So that was the beginning. It was probably like July 2020. I positioned myself in front of them, kept conversation going. Raptors were already down south in the bubble. They had their bus wrapped in Black Lives Matter, but yep. MLSE was still figuring out like which you know kind of senior roles and C-suite positions to create a full practice of diversity and inclusion. And once the chips all fell, I shot a shot to the one job opportunity. Thankfully, I didn't get it. My buddy got it because it was um, it was involving all three other teams. I was really just focused on the hockey. Okay, but this was an opportunity for them, Brandon Shanahan and Kyle, to be like, well. I think we still need Mark because his ability to go right into the room as a player, teammates of some of these guys, and talk to the players right away in a manner of education that we just simply can't. Right. So they said, look, we were able to carve out a little extra salary for you, and there's no real job description because <laughs> we can't tell you what to do. Um, you know, So I was blessed that they still knew that there was value in what needed to happen and what I could bring that I wasn't positioning myself like, y'all need to change. I was like, we need to change it, and I think I can help you. I think you want to. You just don't know how. And that was by the time I got hired, I guess it was like March 1st. It was my first day of 21. So I was about an 11-month transition from playing to not. And I remember Shanahan saying afterwards, like, I'm, he was really proud because he's done it. He's like, anytime I see a guy complete that transition or go, mm-hmm. it's like, it's not always easy to land on your feet and find what's next. And this is clearly, this is now a career for you. This is clearly something you're good at, you're passionate about, yeah. the intersection of, you know, hockey, you're and clearly you an expert in. Yeah, and back to like that Jackie Robinson, Bobby Orr, like book reports, like this has always been me. I'm now just able to talk more about like the Jackie Robinson side. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's that's what the whole thing looked like. It was an interesting journey of about seven or so months since I first connected with the Leafs organization before I got brought back in, but... Um, unfortunate circumstances and the murdering of George Floyd, but really did create opportunity for myself and some others in the game to say, if y'all don't see that there's a problem now, not just in what happened in that incident, but how we've been able to manage it, talk about it, navigate the like, ooh, do these things happen in our world too? It might not be, you know, police officers taking someone's life, but just, you know, navigating racial waters in a way where we didn't think these things existed. Yeah, they do happen. Mm-hmm. Let's bring people in who can also speak the language or from this product, give them an opportunity to help us be better. And that's sort of what I've been able to create and doing doing it, creating my own lane, not a scout, not you know media, yeah, yeah. not a coach, created an opportunity in a lane that did not exist before where I also get to bring my creative side to it because I'm also trying to build brand affiliation and new demographics that I know love hockey and love the game and love the Leafs. We just don't do a great job of speaking to them. Right, right. So you were able to use all the skills that you were trying to build a business in and essentially bring that to the Leafs. So your experience as a hockey yep. player, your networking ability, your ability to speak, all those skills are things that you learned and honed playing hockey mm-hmm. and took that to the Leafs and, and created a job for yourself. Very much so. And yeah. like earlier saying, you don't know, how am I going to take these skills and use them in whatever? Right. Sometimes you, I'm still asking myself that. And then I had a buddy turn around and say like, the phrase which you don't realize is you're doing it right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. So, yeah, you sometimes don't recognize it in the moment, but, you know, you have that DNA. Yeah. If you're pursuing a particular thing, whatever the goal is, the vision, oh, I think I want to convince this person that I can do X. You're exercising and utilizing a lot of these characteristics and skills that we talked about in the transitional manner. You just don't recognize it in the moment until you're out and you're like, oh, wow, I, I, I was I was doing that. I was exercising good time. leadership, yeah. communication, whatever, work resilience, whatever that may be the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Um, what does identity mean to you? And what is it what did it mean ten years ago when you were an athlete? What does it mean today? Oh wow. Um, identity to me means right now means um uh personality. Um the ability to, it means confidence. It means, and I mean that in the way of there's been, and that's maybe an answer on what it used to, from what it used to not mean to now is the ability to have one's confidence to just be that identity, to, to not be, have an identity of something that's not completely in whole, fully you. Yeah. Um, but understandably for any number of reasons, self-talk, imposter syndrome, you know, just for general fear, insecurities, 
you might not always want to be or show that full side of you. Did you feel that as a hockey player? Insecure? Of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, again, everyone has their own insecurities, but definitely, they're definitely, and I don't know if it's always, there's obviously elements where I'm still unpacking myself or there's subconscious like, damn, was I thinking or acting that way because I felt there was this other pressure or was it just because I was feeling, or, you know, there's a lot, and, and you realize there's a lot you are unpacking that you haven't before. Identity is... um yeah, you know, just one's 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 confidence and, and security in, in just, you know, walking out the door every day, being who they need to be and doing that confidently and proudly. What it used to mean for me is um, I would probably have said something similar, but it wouldn't have been completely true just with regards to like the I mean, like that's what identity is. But I'm not co- comfortable doing it, yeah. <laughs> you know, like um, I, I, I think it's yeah, it's it's how you want to be seen and. Yeah, how you want to be seen and perceived, um, but doing it unapologetically. Um, do you think the social ideology of an athlete that because you make money, your life is set? Do you think most hockey players or athletes in general know how to how to transition, know how to go from this thing and find purpose in something else? Because right now, no, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> right now, you 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 have a purpose. Right. You've you've transitioned and you've gone from something that you love to do for 30 years into something that you now are passionate about and you care about. And then that exudes and it shows. Mm. Right. Not everyone has that. Mm -hmm. So do you think even if even if you had 32 million dollars, you think it would help? Which I don't. Right. No, I mean, (laughs) you think it would help or change anything or would you would you still think you'd go through the same sort of? No, you still go through the same thing. I'm not a hockey player. I'm not an NHLer that can speak from the perspective of walking away and having Boku bucks in the bank account. I'm Um, using that from now on. Boku bucks. Yeah, I I think that's uh, (laughs) a. I need that. I feel I I feel like that might be from Andre 3000 or something. Yeah. But but, uh, (laughs) it's a. no, I'm, I mean, that's not me. But I, before I got to this position of retiring, I had buddies who had made lots of money and, and even the ones who did the hard way but still made lots of money. Um, and when they were done, you know, we've all played with guys who you're like, oh, man, when that guy's done, if he's not staying in the game in some way, like he's not going to have any idea what to do yeah, because you, his identity is so wrapped in like, I'm a hockey player. And that's it. I'm a hockey player and that's it. I've been like hardcore the hockey player since 13. I wear the hat. The, the, all of Those it. Birkenstock sandals. All of it, yeah. the, you got the, the spitter going. The, yeah, yeah, I was about to say the it, shit yeah. in your mouth. All yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just the prototypical. I got my little Lulu shorts on. My ass is hanging out because she's oh, big, you know, skating bum. You know, it's so easily identifiable. Um, at least I had like the Jamaican <laughs> and hockey player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you almost caught me. You almost caught me there. You have to edit that yeah. part out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, we exactly like. There's just that like there. It's, it's their identity in every which way, and there's nothing wrong with that. But again, I always love the slogan of like more than an athlete. Yeah, you know, man. I never just wanted to be like the singular like, oh, that's a hockey player and nothing else. Um, so there's definitely you play with those those athletes that you see like they haven't been prepared for some, whenever this day, whenever this thing's just not and a it's thing not their anymore. fault because you, you can't make it unless you put everything into it. Yeah. Absolutely. Which yeah. you did. And I did. How you got I there. was just, and I know lots of other guys that I played at the same time, but I was also a guy that was able to, and maybe for different reasons, because what you're going through at the time is stressful. You want to turn it off. Excuse me. When you go home. Yeah. So you find something else that you're into. And I was trying to find a, profession in some of that other stuff. Um, but if I think guys step away and, and, and even with the money that they might have, if the journey is any easier, the answer is no. Cause I can, again, think of some guys I know who, you know, had made millions, but they didn't have that sense of purpose when it was done. And the difficulty, especially as a pro athlete is the standard you put on yourself. Oh boy. You always, your entire life has been setting a goal, accomplishing it. Next goal, setting a goal, accomplishing it. Next goal, like to make it to the NHL, I don't know what the numbers are in this country, but it's, you know, far, far, far less than the 1% who play, do it. Yeah. And then how many stay? And then to stay and then to stay long enough and then make another career out of it. And all, exactly. So there's, it's a very small percentage. So you are so groomed and used to constantly accomplishing that new goal yeah. and facing adversities, whether it be, you know, an injury, getting traded, you know, all these unsigned, all these various things, you're trained to continue to like jump into a challenge and come out victorious, jump into it. And it might be, a, you know, not the exact victory you wanted, but nonetheless, you keep pursuing and keep achieving mm-hmm. and then boom, that's done. 
It doesn't matter how much money you got under your mattress when that's all done. If you don't have fulfillment and that sense of purpose, the money doesn't matter. The money does not matter. It does not buy you happiness. It might be easy. It might help you not stress about like, well, how am I going to pay for my mortgage? Yeah, yeah. But beyond that, like you, you, you can't be so geared and driven and passionate for like elite performance, high pressure performance, and then just shut that like yeah that, turn that, that off, that off no, <laughs> you know <laughs> and be like i'm literally just going to be do, doing x let now me just I'm spend good. my money i'm good yeah um and also just like for our own value too like you know no one if you're a parent you know and you're making your kids lunch and getting them safely to school every day very honorable job and responsibility but no one's giving you a gold star for that no one's patting you on the back and saying good job phrase sometimes i might make just a good breakup pass or like a break up a play and i come back to the bench and that little like Good job phrase is just constant that endorphin of like your value. Good job. Yeah. You did something good. Pat on the back. Pat on the back. Keep going. Good job, Mark. Good job, Mark. Good job, Mark. It's that little gold star we look for. It might not be 20,000 people standing up cheering me, but it's that like your coach, your boss, your players, whatever, your goalie giving you a tap saying, you did it good today. You did it well today. You did it well today. In regular life, like, you know, doing you your kids there. laundry and putting, you know, that no one's getting that. Yeah. And so there's also this emptiness, I think, from the athlete of, well, who am I now? And I want to be a dad, a successful mother, parent, whatever, take care of my family, build whatever off my legacy, create opportunity for them that I maybe didn't have. But there's that emptiness because we also are looking for some type of reward and gratification, satisfaction from like um, a validation from others as well. 100%. A pat on the back, a keep it going. Uh, you've been doing that for 20 years. And all the time. And it's really hard. All the time. Wow, yeah. we need, you, you made this team, great job. We were really impressed with what you did. Like, no one's telling you that no more. Right. And that part is hard to navigate through because it's it's kind of how we reaffirm our value in ourselves along the journey of being a pro athlete yeah. is that good job, keep going. You did something great today. A lot of my self-confidence came from that as an athlete, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, you talked about outcomes. So I wanted to ask... As an athlete, like we are very outcome driven, hundred mm -hmm. percent. Like you, you make this team to get to this level, and once you get there, it's like you unlock a, you you unlock something in your mind that you can now get to this level, yeah. that level, and then you keep climbing. So, do you view your outcomes? Obviously, you played at the highest level in the world, but do you do you view your outcomes as a success? And if you if you could change anything, would you? So past outcomes past so your <clears throat> your career do you yeah. view that as a success Obviously, definitely yeah the answer yeah, is yes definitely would you change anything um i mean there might not at the top of my head i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure if i can remember the whole script going back there's definitely elements you might change i think i think in some over my career probably some ways that i would maybe do things differently and feel the ability or empowerment perhaps a little bit too now is advocate for myself a bit more mm. um it's it's easy uh, you know uh, there's a couple teams I played on where I was a real value to that team, but I was a role player. You know, I'm, I'm a defensive defenseman, played a real physical game. I pride myself on being a good defenseman, but I definitely was not an offensive defenseman. Um, you know, we're down by a goal or two late in the game. I'm not going on the ice, but we're trying to preserve that one goal lead late in the game. I'm your guy. There's a lot of value in that and who I was as a leader and a presence in the locker room and the personality and characters that I had that not are all, they're not all measurable on the ice, perhaps say in performance. Um, and back to like the unfamiliarity, there's moments perhaps where you're competing for a position that you really feel you deserve or you're being treated a particular way just for whatever reason, um, not always racially where you're just, you're kind of not in the plans, you're healthy scratch, you're out of the lineup and would never want to bring like a negative attitude into a positive environment. The guys are winning, but I'm not a part of the success. Like this sucks, but I'm not about to be moping around here because I ain't trying to bring that, yeah. that, that energy down. For sure. But there's just moments you can think back in those situations like, but could I have gone and said something? Could I have engaged in the conversation with the manager or coach or whatever sooner? Could I have gone and found out like, hey, what can I do here instead of just being like, be happy you're here, be happy you're here type of mentality. Um, but didn't necessarily have the confidence either because I wasn't like the all-star guy. I wasn't, you know, uh, a prominent name per se. So you just, and in the mentality of kind of being a soldier and the role in which I play, like I'm a dog, like people know me here, the coaches, the players are going to say like, that guy's work, he'll, he'll run through a wall for us. So running through a wall for you, that mentality is like, well, I'll, I'll also shut up and just like take what's given to me. Right. And I think I would have wished I, in moments, um, to just, you know, advocate for yourself a bit more. Doesn't mean do things more, are necessarily going to change. Yeah. 
but at least let them know and engage kind of in that conversation instead of just like taking it. And, and, and a lot of, at least when my, I played, like their, their communication wasn't always great. So you might be playing well and then also not a lineup and then not in the lineup for a little bit. And like, no one's told you. I had games where I was literally in warmups and I'm like, am I playing? Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I'm playing. And I remember being in Montreal playing for the Devils. Larry Robinson is one of my favorite coaches and Hall of Famer as a coach player. He's an amazing guy. But he was my D coach. And Jacques Lemaire, who's, again, the old, old Montreal Canadian from the 70s, like won everything, won as a coach, um, old school guy. Anyways, I'm, I'm in warm-ups and we're shooting on Brodeur. And I'm like, someone asked me, he's like, what are the D pairings you in? I was like, I don't, the game's in like 20 minutes. I have no idea if I'm in or not. And just thinking like mentally preparing. Mm -hmm. I've been preparing all day not knowing if I'm going to be in or not. And I look at Larry and I just kind of melt him like, am I in? And he goes like, I don't know. And he's standing kind of greeting some fans in the hall. Cause he's a uh, Montreal legend and Jacques right beside him. So we do like a half moon shooting, shoot on Broder, take a little skate, come back for the other, like ha quick half moon shooting. And then I hear like a bang on the glass and I turn over his Larry and he's got a sheet of paper and he just slams it against the like, bam. And just, no, <laughs> it's written uh. on it. And I'm just like, all right, cool. Thanks. Yeah. Like, at least I can just go about the rest of my warmups and going through the motions now. And like, Hey, you're in the lineup. So like, make sure you hop in for this drill. Not me. Um, but again, thinking in ways like that, like I would have loved to go back and been like, can y'all not let me know a bit sooner? Like, is I, like, what can I do to be, to secure myself into this lineup? And what can we do so that all of us as a team aren't figuring this out like seconds before the game? Because that's not necessarily ideal. And that's a bit of old school, maybe mind games or whatever that coaches might have played back in the day. But it's like that type of thing. Advocating for yourself in those moments to be like, what I really, what teams players really appreciate is actually just like transparency and communication. Yeah, I can real. take the bad news that I might not be in the lineup. <laughs> just tell me like last night, this morning, before we the bus pulled up to the rink, whatever, you know, like this moment, I don't know, like you can't, are you really still deciding yeah, yeah. if like <laughs> yeah. I'm in or not? I should know. Yeah, I should know. And, and, and those types of things can just wear on you as an athlete. So I wish I would have advocated more to just have those types of candid conversations, but it feels weird when sometimes when you're the player with not a lot of opportunity, oh, lots of opportunity, but not a lot of like privilege or leash to what feels like engaging the conversation with the parent. You rather like yeah. the parent, the coach, like be the one to start it. Just want to be quiet. Yeah. How do you remain competitive today? Because you're playing uh, such a physical sport. You're a defenseman. You're yeah. obviously throwing your body around, hitting people, probably fighting. So yeah, um, miss the fighting. Yeah. <laughs> how do you? Uh, how do you channel that now? Um, that's another good question. Uh, through um, well, thanks. You know, yeah. I wrote it myself. Yeah, <laughs> I like that one. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm lucky. There's an easy way. Me, I'm lucky. There's an easy way um, because I'm still with the team. Okay. So, what I there are ways that what I specifically do from a culture perspective can help our players, can help build camaraderie, can help build empathy amongst the group in ways that actually helps them grow and be closer together, care more for each other, to compete more for each other. So there's elements of what I can try to do with players that actually, I hope, will transition to on the ice as well. Mm -hmm. So that small, that small way that I can influence or impact them allows me, and just being around it, you want to be successful. You know, I'm around the team, and the most important thing is still to win. So it's easy enough for me to maintain that competitive edge because I'm still part of something where every single day we're trying to win. Yeah. Um, but for myself and my role in particular, I think that the competitiveness is also still so strong because my particular agenda and what I'm doing, what my responsibilities are off the ice now are to continue to grow and push for change and innovation and new thought and constant advocating not just within, you know, a, a, a team, an NHL team's front office or, or uh, team operations or team in general through the business side, through all the different departments and business units that support an NHL franchise from ticketing to content, broadcast integrations, retail partnerships, our procurement. These are all different ways where I can continue to influence and inspire and the competitive edge stays there because... I have to like go into, I got to go into the ring every single day. Yeah. And you're fighting for something you know? that is undefeated thus far. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> I'm fighting against something that I wouldn't have a job if it has been defeated. Exactly. Um, so 
and that's it. And I work with a lot of wonderful, great people who obviously champion this type of work. Um, you know, I had a lot of soldiers around the company at MLSE who very much lean in, and it is a front of mind thing, not just the ones who uh, want to do it but aren't sure how, but ones who are actively trying to find ways we can integrate and improve culture and inclusion throughout our sport, our brand, um, and our own internal operations. But yeah, that's the competitive edge is, to be honest, it feels like what I do now compared to what I used to do as a hockey player who, yeah, fought a lot and, and, and physically like had to use his body as not just a way to defend, but a way to prevent and punish and, and protect my own teammates. Um, the competition, it's almost more competitive now because mm-hmm. I'm doing something to your point that is undefeated. Silent They're, battle. So it's very silent. It's, it's behind the scenes. It's, it's in, you know, emails, it's in the office. It's, it's very much removed. Some of it's public facing, but those are like the outcomes. Those are the wins. Those mm-hmm. are like, look mm-hmm. at this thing that we're now celebrating or executing or whatever, touching people's lives with the work in the, on the back end of it. And again, I say this saying like I'm empowered by MLC and the Leafs and a lot of great people around me, but the entire ecosystem is very much still unsure and unfamiliar and in some cases uncaring. Um, that fuels a competitive edge because it's a lot more than just winning hardware for me now. It's, it's also winning in life and it's, helping get significant wins for my community and communities like ours that are just trying to legit just trying to be a part of something legit just trying to be welcomed legit mm-hmm. just trying to um, have a seat at the table yeah have a seat yeah. at the table just have their identity also be represented in whatever it is this thing is um space to be seen you know like yeah. it's it's not that crazy or foreign of a thing we talk about and it gets scary to talk about but I'd say the competitive edge is easily maintained simply because I'm very much and fighting to stay in the league, fighting to be a pro athlete. That's like hard. Um, but fighting on this side of it to push for like real sustainable, non-performative change that'll last uh, 20 years. When we connect and go to a game, it'll, we'll see the effects yes. of the work that's being done right now. That's like, how can I not stay competitive? Yeah. Exactly. Um, for I mean, I, I don't know if you said it already, but what is your like? What is the title of your role right. at MLSC right now? And I want to dive into just real quick what you did during the All Star Game. I mean, that's uh, that's nice. what I got to see. I see it on social media. I thought that was dope, and and I'd I'd love for you to touch upon that and just talk about what you did. Yeah, thank you. So my role uh, is Director of Culture and Inclusion for the okay. Toronto Maple Leafs. Um, and again, yeah, so that touches you know anything from creating player or staff education awareness opportunities um, sometimes small touch points sometimes you can do longer form um, getting the players comfortable with the different causes or communities they actually do care about already mm-hmm. um, and just showing them meaningful ways that they can get involved stand up be courageous enough to like leverage their platform or voice to support x um, in real organic ways ways that you know again from their perspective like this will be in one that they'd want to do because i'm I understand their perspective on these things. Then on the business side, as I mentioned, you know, just being able to influence, ideate, create, and influence new strategy kind of in all these different parts of the business that work either culture and inclusion or better leaf brand affinity can grow in different diverse communities. So it's great in the sense I have a fair bit of autonomy to, um, you know, learn this business. This business has a player I never had any idea <laughs> existed around the game. thought the business was like trades and contracts, not like, how do we entertain people for three hours or only one hour is the actual game yeah. in their venue, you yeah. know? So getting a cool perspective of the business that I was so naive as a player, didn't even really realize. Um, so that, that's how my, my role um, is, I guess, to operate. Um, looking to plant seeds in different places and hoping they get watered. And they don't always do, so I got to maybe go back and do the watering myself and just kind of continue to encourage people, build those soldiers, those advocates around that this is something that will help our business, but we got to be a bit more front of mind on. Yeah. Can't be back in mind, can't be afterthought, can't forget completely. The All-Star was dope, uh, and I remember when it first got, I think they would do like two years in advance, but for whatever reason, it was a year advance that they announced this, and uh, you know where All-Star had been with the league before was um, not in a good spot. So it very much was like, we got to bring the NHL All-Star juice back. We got to make this cool fly, and obviously the league has a good relationship with Toronto, so it's like, 
Leafs. I want to see Hickey Al help us out. We were all obviously very excited. And I remember last February, but like basically a year out, the first meeting that Shanahan had hosted um, with a bunch of MLS EC suite and some front office people. And Spezza was there as, you know, he's now front office with us and he uh, had played in maybe the I don't know, Ottawa one, maybe in 2017 or something like that. So good, like to have a player perspective of what to do around the city that might exhaust a player or not type of thing. And then when Shanahan kicked the buck to me to kind of be like, Mark, you know, what do you think? And uh, my thing was like, I just, I don't got to tell this room what the city's diversity is. Um, uh, so my goal, we know that, we know the numbers. I, my goal is that when people leave this week, they're going to be like, that's what hockey in Toronto looks like? Like, I, dog, I had no idea. Um, so that was my goal is that in everything we're doing, uh, let's try to continue to have that element, just like on, on my day-to-day side, whatever it is we're already doing, let's have this element of actually like, sh- not just from, it might be hard for people to get into like the, the, all the buzzwords of like in the inclusion and build inclusion, but yeah, but this is just the marketplace. This is just Toronto. Like look around Toronto. We all know that cause we live here. Toronto is hella diverse. So let's make sure that is being represented and showcased. And I really felt like that's what we did overall with the whole company and the league. I know the commissioner was ecstatic with the execution of it. And then I think he said it was his best one he had been to since he'd been on the roll. It was like 30 some years. No big deal. No big deal. Right. <laughs> so I got the opportunity to lead a few things that three different things, which I truly feel like had never been done before. Two of them, I believe to be historic. And the one in particular, um, one was one was a really dope element we had at uh, our event we had at Launchpad, yep. our, our, our um, you know sort of multi sport complex for, yep. for underserved youth in the city, and it was purely just a full day. We called it Designathon, but it was really just to integrate uh, university students in STEM, diverse university students in science, tech, engineering, and math, to help show them pathway for employment in the NHL. We do a lot of sticks and hands, and it was tied to our house of hockey, you know, Bieber, Drew House, Ball Hockey League, um, but. I'm still in a position where I'm like, yeah, but we still need more diversity up here too. So that was cool. Just like you could be a data analyst, sports scientist. Did you know that NHL has these jobs? So just creating that opportunity was amazing. The kids, the students now see like, oh my goodness, I never thought I could do it. And now I have a whole new dream. So that was incredible. Really full fun day. Um, Had an amazing girls showcase at uh, Nathan Phillips Square where we had 14, 15 year old AAA players. Um, all racialized, majority black, um, a few Asian, a few indigenous, uh, all female diverse coaches from Vicky Sanahara, Canadian Olympian, Angela James, you know, first black woman in the Hall of Fame, Soroya Tinker from Black Girl Hockey Club. Yeah, shout uh, out to Soroya. Shout out to Soroya. Um, uh, Krishanda Green, Nyla Brooks from Seaside. And what was amazing there is we also had, as I'll get to, some black alumni from the Leafs in town. And one of them, John Craig, had an awesome guy. He uh, is from Vancouver, owns a junior B team. So he's very much involved in the player development space. And he's like, first of all, we don't have girls game that is like this nice in Van, let alone this many racialized girls. This was like 25 young little like, you know, Julie Chu's and Sarah Nurses and, and, and Bridget Laquetta. It was not, they're doing the Michigan, they're like toe dragging, they're scooping the puck up. It was a real showcase of like, here's what's going on and here's what we got. Yeah. Um, it was, it was beautiful to see. Um, but the bang and dopest thing, dopest thing that I did that I really enjoyed was that meant the mo- probably the thing that meant the most to me in my, um, honestly, my whole career, like on or off the ice was this collaboration with two black guys. Two black guys. Um, yeah, man, that was that was phenomenal. Yeah, we we yeah, two black guys, shout out to Adrian from two black guys for um this retail capsule and um pretty, you know, bold and different brand yeah. as far as like what might exist in hockey and with the Leafs brand. But what was amazing for it is I knew I met him before a couple of years ago as a dope staple in the city, you know, from back in the day. Um, and he's just an example of black excellence himself, right? He's been the creative director for OVO and Roots and Canada Goose and Hudson Bay. Yeah. But this thing from, you know, 90s hip hop selling out of his car um, was just so organic and his whole mo- message of unapologetically black and something that I just never, we, we often felt but weren't able to like ever do or say or <laughs> be, Yeah. you know? We very much, at, at times I felt like had to apologize for being black in mm-hmm. hockey. A lot of people didn't understand that messaging, which was also cool. Because it was like, if you're not understanding the messaging, it's also not necessarily for you. 
But so what we did, and I remember talking to them about it, you know, we had Mitchell and Ness collab as well. So they had the license with the league. They did the cut and sew. Adrian and his team did all the design. I was like, how are we going to connect this to the Leafs? I said, well, for one, uh, All-Stars is coming out on February 1st. So they can't say no. <laughs> <laughs> we got, you know, we, we, we were benefiting from Black History Month. But um, it's, I said, we're going to connect it to the eight black alumni who have played for the Leafs. Val James, the first African-American to play in the NHL. Grant Fuhr is the first black everything in the NHL. Uh, All-star, Hall of Famer, cup winner. Jamal Mares won Stanley Cups. Wayne Simmons played 1,000 games and just finished with the Leafs. Um, he and Grant are the only two black MVPs at an All-star game in the NHL. Um, myself and my role, I'm the first black executive with the Leafs. So there's like greatness represented all throughout these eight guys, but a lot of the stories just weren't known. And what I got to do was by tying it to them when leveraging the eight alumni through the marketing material and the storytelling and just like what it meant to be unapologetically black in hockey. When we first fell in love with the game our what it first meant to like see your name on a Leafs Jersey and that like our love and passion for the leaf and what it meant for us as hockey kids to wear that. I thought this was going to be a real merger or like of bringing black culture and hockey together. And then I realized what it was, once we actually launched it and had this dope pop-up at Throne Barbershop on Richmond, you know, it was this beautiful space with retail, a bar, um, old school hockey jerseys all over the walls and stuff. And a lot of black folk, <laughs> predominantly black folk, allies, other people along. But it wasn't a merger of the two cultures. It was actually a celebration of what's always existed here. Mm -hmm. And I realized that by looking around the room with everyone we invited, it's like, well, she's in the Hall of Fame. He's in the Hall of Fame. He was the first to do this. He hosts Hockey Night in Canada. You know, TSN analyst, TSN analyst, uh, NHL executive, you know, MLSC executive, Raptors executive, like music executive, but as always, it was wearing a Leafs jersey. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like all these different touch points, player, player, alumni, alumni, alumni. Um, it was like, whoa, this isn't, none of us here, everyone walked into that room, 250 people, already a hockey fan. Maybe 99% were already hockey fans. 95, 90% of the room was diverse. So it wasn't just a merging of the two. It was actually celebrating what's already been here, what's mm -hmm. already existed, and existed at a high level. Because you're not at this level without having spent decades already like on this craft in some way. Before the event kicked off, like the actual party portion, we had tw about 20 kids coming in, um, just over maybe from uh, Hockey Equality, young black kids. They were m doing a meet and greet with four of the alumni. Uh, signing, getting their autograph signed. They could make their own little Mitchell and Ness hat with their own personal like decals on it, get their sneakers cleaned. Kids were getting fades. Kids were getting their hair braided. Oh, sick. It was dope. It was like, there's a moment. Uh, it was just the representation I know that they felt was so cool. You know, some moms like my own mom would have been like, I don't know what to do with this kid's hair. And they're like, I got you. And just started putting yeah. twists and braiding it, you know? But it was, that part of it was also amazing because you're seeing some of the kids' faces and some of the photography and you're like, I've never been in a room where I met at that many NHL alumni and they all look like me not just look like me but also like had the swag and the style that like we're not always that again clean shaven no dreads like right. I wasn't no earrings I wasn't allowed to rep fashion and the and that you know black culture of of the intersecting fashion um and creativity to the game of hockey is something that's so desperately needed because I represent that in a way where that's always been there I've always been there I've always had that in me and I'm I'm, I'm hockey there's not yeah. many people who have a greater hockey resume than me in a lot of the rooms I go into. So it was a pure celebration of kind of what's already existed. It was definitely a bold collaboration, but it just made a lot of sense. Um, you know, front office and Shanahan were down with it. I told them, you know, when you wore Roots clothing in the Olympics, Adrian designed those. So like it's, it's mm -hmm. yeah, like you've actually already repped this creator stuff. Um, so in that sense, it was cool. But when you have guys like Val James and Grant Fuhr saying um, what this has meant to them, like if this Priceless. has been this has been the peak of their year, wow. is being able to be brought back in a room, having a dinner the night before the shoot with the, our group of guys where we've never been in a room together, sharing the stories, unpacking things, the good, the bad, all of them being the same. Some of them having very degrees of brutality to them, depending on the generation. But when you meet someone and it's instantaneously like, oh, they know me like that, but. I've only known them for 15 minutes. I have hockey guys who are my best friends who like this n new person already knows me on a level where none of my hockey friends actually have or do super special. And, and again, you know, I'm a kid who grew up and put Val James picture on a t-shirt. So to be able to do something that he can turn around and say like, this has been the highlight of my year and I've never felt like this type of love or been brought back in this way. We have a new 
brotherhood within the brotherhood and, and new family and new teammates that we didn't know we knew existed but we'd just never been a part of before and yeah. never had anyone be like let's do something and celebrate y'all before it's too late um it was incredibly special so to create that create like from a young 12 year old me to see this retail collab and be like "Ooh, the Leafs did what like i connect to that now to an og being like I feel seen, I feel seen yeah. you know, it was, it was incredible. It was a real merger of what our culture is and, and that this is actually already exists in the game and hockey just actually doesn't realize how cool it actually is. Like hockey is. Um, and, and this is one way I'm trying to un- unlock that. The retail was just a vehicle to tell a dope story, but it hit with a lot of people. Yeah. That's amazing, man. I, I got, I saw the video. Um, it was, it was phenomenal, man. I, I wish that. I could have been there. Obviously yeah. I, I couldn't, I couldn't make it, but uh, I had a game that day, but, um, you know, our good friend Ellis who connected yeah. us, I was supposed to come. So it would have been great to see, but oh, man, saw well. the video and you, you did a phenomenal job. Thank man. you. Um, to conclude, we usually play a game. Uh, I, it's called for three. So you can answer any of the following in one word or one sentence. Ready to play? Sure. Okay. Uh, when people hear the name Mark Frazier, what's the first thing they should think of? Um... I know these are good questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one thing that they should think of is um, first thing they should think of. Oh, first thing, sorry, they should think of is uh, the guy, the guy who's the guy who's trying to create change. Hockey is finish the sentence. <laughs> so many different thoughts are trying to. Hockey's dope. It is. People Simple. may not think it, but and that's part of what we're trying to do here is, or I'm trying to do is, hockey's dope and 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 hockey just doesn't know it yet. Hmm. If every athlete had to do one thing when they retire, what would it be? Hmm. Wow. These are. I'm sure they're supposed to be quick hitters, but they're, they're too take, good. Take your time. Uh, athletes got to do one thing when they retire. What should it be? Um, poof. Oh, uh, shoot. Man, I would say take, take time to, this might be weird, but take time to like reflect and celebrate mm. whatever you've just done and experienced. It might have been one year. It might have been 20. The one year might not have been nearly as much as you wanted, but it's really hard to be a pro athlete. Yeah. Um, no matter what version, I tell someone who played one game in the NHL, as soon as they play that game, I said, you're in. You officially did it. If no other games come after this, you're still going down forever. You're going to be known as an NHL hockey player. 100%. So even if it's not the full bucket you're hoping to get to, take, take some time to be kind to yourself and, and reflect and celebrate on whatever, even if it drastically ended in a way you weren't hoping. Celebrate what you did and what you accomplished and be patient. Um, that might be two things, but be patient in that with, with, with what's coming next. Um, because you've always been in control of like, I need this boom, go make it happen. Yeah. It's not going to be like that anymore or whatever you're probably going to do afterwards, but be patient with yourself and whatever that needs to mean for a person, but celebrate and reflect on what you did. Cause even as you know, whatever that resume is like, not many people have it. Yeah. Um, and then whatever's to come next, just be patient. Don't that be was, hard on yourself. That was I, well, shit. That's that's hard to do. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. But you know, definitely, and it's something I've grown. Like earlier on, especially with the role I had, I was like, why aren't things happening faster? And then you kind of like, when I hear people say, it, I was like, ha, you're new to this, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, because yeah, we just you know something we, we all got to learn. Is just be patient with yourself and 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 what's whatever it is you're you're walking you see into. See what you next. did there. You're so used to fighting, you put your hand up. Right <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, listen, I want to thank you for taking the time. Um, really appreciate your insights and um, the work that you're doing. I think it's impactful. I think a lot of people who are going to watch this can learn from you. And uh, I think it's phenomenal that you are one of eight black players to play out of the thousands or I think it's yeah, one, one, a one thousand, thousand yeah. a little, 1,063 athletes yeah. to play for the Leafs. You're, you're, you're one of eight. And I think what you're doing in terms of your work now is so much more impactful and meaningful than anything you could ever done on the, you know, um, uh, on the ice. I appreciate that. So, um, with, with, with that being said, this, this episode is concluded, but again, man, I want to thank you for taking the time. Appreciate it really means a lot to me. No, it's been a lot. This is, I love, I love what you're doing here as well. And thank you for having me. And honestly, it means a lot. Perfect.
Appreciate you. Love, man. <laughs> hey, guys, if you like this episode, I have a really good feeling you're going to like the other one. So if you could, do us a favor, like, comment, share, and subscribe.